Gemara. Anything else before we begin our study? We're in chapter 3, Romans chapter 3. And the question is asked, and I don't know, we had gone through verse 1 and 2, had we not? The question is asked, what advantage then, and I'm not going to go back and give an exegesis on it again, but we will look at it. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumstances? And we said last week that was the answer. With a yes and with a no, what advantage uh, does the Jew have? Over, and he's talking about over the Gentile. Or does, does the Jew have any advantage over the Gentile? And since the Jews were believing as they as they were, if I if I keep the law instead of obeying the law, then I have a one way ticket to heaven. I mean, I, I mean, it's, I've been assured to go to heaven, and 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 that's not true. This is what Paul is trying to get straightened out. And uh, in this manner, the Jew has no more advantage than Gentile. Gentile can't go to heaven unless he accepts Jesus Christ, and neither can the Jew. So. But, but, but it goes deeper than that because verse 2 says much in every way. And notice it says of what profit is there of circumcision and there's no, no profit in the physical act of circumcision none whatsoever. The idea of the physical circumcision as we understand it was a spiritual picture of what ought to happen in the heart. <coughs> And I touched on that in the sermon, or at least I thought I did this morning, I think I did, that we're to have a circumcision of the heart, and that just simply means cutting away or doing away with those things that, that are no good. Uh, we don't, we, it, it, we, we're not supposed to have our life filled up with things that's going to hinder us in our Christian living, and, and, and this is what circumcision of the heart is all about. Then verse 2 says, much in every way, chiefly or mainly, or, or, or the main point, or first of all, they had the first opportunity because unto them were given the articles of God. Uh, they were given the law of God. They were given the way of God. God came to them. In the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were given the great commission to go into all of the world. And they they rejected all of this. But they had the first opportunity of being saved. And, and, and they rejected. Now, in, uh, in verse 3, <clears throat> it says, For what if some did not believe that before we can really do justice to that, we're going to have to go to Proverbs, if you want to go there, to the 8th chapter of Proverbs. Or what if some did not believe? Now you just find Proverbs and hold it until I get ready to go there. With Proverbs chapter 8. And in our Roman study, what if some did not believe? In other words, they had the... Uh, and even though some did not believe, you can read it that way. They had the first opportunity and they did not believe. Does that do away? This is, this is what Paul is asking. Does that do away with the promise that God had made? And, and I don't know if we touched on that or not. Some of them refused the promise. Some of them refused to believe. And when they refused to believe, they refused the promise that God had made, which is found in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, believeth in him should not perish, but have an eternal life. Now the thing we need to understand, and I may come back to this later on, but the thing that we need to understand that God gave that promise and made that promise a long time before John the Apostle or John the Beloved was ever born. Uh, God didn't wait until John got ready to write the Gospel of John and, and, 
and this was already in the plan of God that whoever believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, God declares and makes a promise that he that they would be saved. Now we're getting into the integrity of God. Now I want I want you to uh, uh, think about something. How many of you have ever thought about the integrity of God? You know what integrity is. If God makes a promise and does not follow through with it, what does that do to the integrity of God? Why? No one would have any right to believe anything that God said. <clears throat> so we're, we're talking about the integrity. How then can anyone believe that God would say, if you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shall be saved? That is one of the absolutes found in the Word of God. How is it then that anyone could doubt eternal security? When they, when they doubt eternal security, they're doubting the integrity of God. They are in reality saying that you cannot trust God to keep the promises that he made. Now, if I say that, and I believe that, and I stand on that, you tell me how I can be saved. I don't believe that I can be saved if I doubt the integrity of God. If I believe that I can lose my salvation, I don't think I've ever had it to begin with because I am saying, again, I am saying you cannot trust God because that's in black and white. For whosoever believeth upon the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, we find that the Bible says that no man, he says, though my should turn to the 10th chapter of John. The Gospel of John, the 10th chapter. In the 27th verse, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Now I want to know, how can you misunderstand that? I mean, there's no interpretation to it. He, he just plain says that my sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, period. Now that's another absolute. God said, God makes that promise. And if, I, and if I doubt that, if I don't believe that, I'm saying that you can't trust God to keep His promise. Because that's a promise in black and white that I can understand and you can understand and anybody else can understand if they're saved. Now, I'm, that, that's hard, I know. But I don't believe anybody is saved that, that, that doubts the integrity of God. God is holy. God is righteous. And we better be very careful about how. Now, we, there's some things we don't understand. But that doesn't mean that we doubt. But if I say, I don't, I believe that if I, if I get saved by your sin, that I'm lost again, that's doubting the integrity of God. I don't believe that's salvation. For what if some did not believe? All right, go to the 8th chapter. Let's begin with verse uh, 33. Huh? I did you? If I did. Right. We going to find out? Alright, first of all, who's doing, who's writing this? Alright, Solomon's doing it. He's the author. Well, God is the author, but he's the, he's the human penman. He's the human author, we'll say. Alright? So, uh, in, uh, let me find the place. I, I got to where I can't. 
I'm going to let me mark it, and then I can always go right back here. All right, Solomon is doing the speaking here. He's doing the writing. He's doing the talking. And uh, he says in verse 33, here instruction. Now, whose instruction? All right. Let, let's, let, let's sort of use the uh, chain of command. Solomon is doing the talking, right? He's doing the, he's doing the writing. We know this under the inspiration of the, uh, of, of the Holy Spirit. In other words, on the blackboard, I had I think him was one of the authors there. Uh, today. All right. But whose instruction? He says, here, instruction. Whose instruction? Well, that would be instruction. But what what is Solomon's? In other words, I'm saying I'm saying I'm teaching tonight, and you better hear me. What did I do? What do I mean? Why did you hear me? All right, coming out of His Word. So what Solomon is doing, he's saying, hear my instructions. He's doing the talking. He's doing the writing. He's the one doing the speaking. So he's saying, hear my instruction. But he has every right to say that. Why? Okay. Because it's not, it's, it's instruction coming through Solomon, but it's God's instruction, you see. All right, so he says, hear instruction. Now let's find out what the word hear means. Huh? If you're just listening, it's going one ear and out the other, but if you hear it, you're fine. All right, what, then what you're saying is that the reason he uses the word hear He's saying the same thing that James did when he said, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. So you're right. It, you, you can sit there and listen to me all night long and may never hear a word that I say in that you will not put it into practice. But this is what this is what Solomon is saying. Uh, hear instruction and be wise. Well, let me go back. Hear instruction. What does that refer to? Well, already, I think we already know that, but it refers to Bible doctrine, does it not? What do I hold in my hand? The mind of Jesus Christ. It doesn't make any difference if in the old or the new. Now, we're a New Testament church. We are New Testament Christians. And, 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 and we don't live under the law. We don't live by the law or any of those things. But this all of it is the word of God. So what, what Solomon is doing, he is saying, listen to the mind of Jesus Christ. He's referring to the instruction which we call Bible doctrine. Now, he says here instruction. Can you finish it? All right, turn that coin over. Well, this is true, but that's not really what the answer I'm looking for. Give me the answer I'm looking for. Be smart. All right, turn the corner over. What does it say? In other words, it says, hear instruction and be wise. Turn the coin over. Stupid. So... Is he saying, would you agree that he is saying that hearing and putting into practice, I mean hearing with the heart, is the only way for a person to truly be wise. You can listen to the philosophers of the world as long as you want to, and you can never be wise. Not really. Not wise in the things that really count. This is what Solomon said. But if we, if we hear the instruction of God, if we hear the mind of Christ, and I mean if we hear it with our spiritual ears, 
We will be wise. How so and why? What is he talking about? Does that mean I'm going to have more brains or my brains is going to be more functional than they would be if I didn't? Some of the smartest men that we have in the world today are atheists or so-called atheists, scientists. Huh? All right. Here instruction is, is another absolute. Now I want you to notice that he did not say, I hope you'll listen. But he says here, and if you look at it closely enough, there's no asking. He didn't say, he didn't ask him to hear instruction. He said here, a direct command. So he, this is a command to, see we don't have any choice. If we want to be wise in the things that really count and the things that will bless our heart, then we're going to be wise in, in Bible doctrine. Now you understand why we have Bible study. I mean, let me ask you something and, and you be truthful with me. I'm going to continue where I'm going anyway. Do you learn more of the Word of God in Bible study or in a sermon? In Bible study, don't you? In Bible instruction. This is where, this is where you learn more. Alright, so this is the reason that Solomon is, doing, is saying what he's doing. And be wise. The only way in this world to be wise is to hear and be obedient to the Word of God. Alright, any questions? Now, our soul, if you remember how, how man came to be, God created his body out of the dust of the earth, and then he freed into his all metal body, and man became a living soul. And I, I come to realize more and more and more and more that when God breathed into the nostrils of man, and man became a living soul, how many of you are familiar with a sponge? Huh? But is that sponge? Does it? Has it ever had life? Rose. When they got it out of the ocean, they had life. A life that soaks. This sponge soaks. Now, if they found if they found a sponge on Mars, they could truthfully say there's life been found on Mars. What? That's not the kind of life that we know of, but it's it was a it was a living thing. All right, the soul of man is comparable to that sponge. Our soul is alive, but it keeps taking in. It keeps taking in. And it will always, forever, as long as we are here, it will continue to take in. That's what he's talking about. Hear instruction. Take in. Let our soul be saturated with the knowledge of the Word of God. And the more we hear, you know, did you know that your heart or that your soul is the same? It, it, it's uh, it's uh, it keeps all this stuff. <coughs> what about what you can't remember? Is it still there or is it gone? Still there. How do we know that? I mean, prove it to me with the Bible. God says your life is an so open book. You stand before him, and that's what he can't do. Well, uh, you'll be judged by your works. You will give an account of your stewardship. You will give an account of your life. When you stand before God, you're going to give an account. All right, how are we going to be able to do that if, if that's not embedded in our very soul and is kept there until the day of judgment to where it will be revealed? So don't think just because you forgot it that it's, that it's gone 
It's, it, because it's, it, it's there to stay until judgment day or else we would never be able to give an account. And that's what the Bible says, you will give an account. You will give an account of your life here on earth. All right, here instruction, and be wise. So he says, fill our soul then, become saturated with the instruction from the word of God. Any questions? And refuse it not. And refuse it not. What does that mean? Let me ask you, let me ask you another one. Do you think that you probably could be guilty of refusing the word of God? What does that mean? Huh? No, 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 no. All right. In other words, you ignore it. But the, don't ignore it. Be filled with the instruction from the Word of God and make sure you don't ignore it or reject it or refuse it. That's what he's saying here. And refuse it not. You see, if you hear the instruction tonight, I don't mean that you're going to remember. I, I won't even remember, and I'm doing the teaching. I, don't, I won't remember every detail. I, if I want to go through this again, I would have to go back, go through my notes and refresh it. You know, bring these things to my memory again. So that's not what he's talking about. What is he talking about? The things that you will hear tonight from this Bible study, you are to what? Be obedient to it. What does that mean? And not refuse. How can it help you? Are you in other words, it gives you more of a workable <laughs> knowledge of the Word of God than you had before you came in. This is how it is that you are so much like a sponge. This stays here. And 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 like I say, you're not going to remember every word, but you are, if you're interested in what we're doing here tonight, you ought to have a, a more of a workable knowledge. In other words, in the morning when you get up and go out to work, you ought to be able to apply better what we learned tonight than if you hadn't been here. You see? Refuse not. No, we don't reject it. Don't ignore it. Put it to work. Any question in verse 8? I mean verse 33. All right, verse 34. Blessed is the man that heareth me. Blessed is the man that heareth me watching daily. At my gates. Waiting at the post of my doors. If you saw this today, you'd find it. Blessed is the man that heareth me. Those that will hear his word, the instruction. Solomon said, if you will hear the instruction that I have for you, you will be a happy person. Turn the coin over. You've heard me say a, a, an awful lot of times, every coin has two sides. So here is the side that says, if you listen to Solomon and listen to his instruction, you'll be happy. Turn it over. If you refuse the instruction, you're going to be filled with misery. Now, folks, listen to me very carefully. It's no good for you to come up here and listen to these Bible studies or to these sermons or to have a part in any part or any phase of our service. Unless you mean business. You've got to mean business. If you don't mean business, you might as well stay at home. Because the, if you don't mean business, then... That's the other side of the coin, people. If you hear instruction, if you if you if you if you're wise with the sayings of God, you're you're going to have the gladness of heart. But if you not, if you don't, then the other side, the only thing left is misery. All right. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates. Now, I don't even know how to explain this. Because it's an unheard of thing in our day. 
But you understand what it said. It, it says that there were people. Solomon said that there were people who came every day. Every day. There were people standing at his gates every day to hear instruction. You know, I, uh, when I was studying this, I was I studied for a week or two ahead of time. I look out here every morning. I didn't see nobody standing out there in front door waiting to hear instruction. I didn't get up on Sunday morning. I don't see nobody standing out there beating at the door trying to get in. Come on. Come on, now. You know it says confession is good for the soul. Huh? The eagerness is not there. We've said that. Do you know what? I know y'all I know y'all are having mercy on me. Do you realize what it would do to me? If I got up out here and I looked out the door at 8 o'clock and there were several of y'all standing out there and said, Come on, preacher, we just can't wait to hear the word of God. I'd have a fifth heart attack. <laughs> but now, it, you know, we have, we've are we been a little facetious and having a little fun here, but why is it not like that? I mean, I don't know. I'm asking. How come it's not like How come people are not as enthused over the instruction from God as they were in Solomon's day. <coughs> now, I mean, let's use common sense now. I mean, we don't want to get rid of and left for the field. Anymore. Saying, well, Israel in the message this morning. And what it's probably going to take to bring the church back is the church can go through a period of time like Solomon had to go through, like Israel had to go through, the whole church of time. Did the church ever see that time before his period? Do we ever, I mean, are we going to come under God's wrath to the point where he's going to bend our knees and make us give my ear? There is a possibility, but I don't believe it. I don't think so either. So I think that's why Revelation, you know, it's like uh, the different churches in Revelation, we're at that state of what lay out of sin here. And our, our main, I mean, is the church fixing to go? I, and, in the lay out of sin period of time? I think so. I think so. so I think we're, we're not we're, we're not, we're not really on fire for God. Then we're, we're not forward. really totally against it. We're on the floor of love, I think. Period of time is important, though. Just keeping out of Alright. That's better. I think you're right. But does it have to be that way? And again, let's use common sense. Uh, how many of you can meet me here Thursday morning at 8 o'clock for a Bible study? How many of you can meet me here then on Friday morning for Bible study and on Saturday morning. Francis came, she's got to go to the yard, so I can't be here and teach it because i got to go with her. <laughs> in other words, the world has stepped in and says you can't do that. I put too much demand on it. Folks, we got to eat. we got we got to make a living for our family. we got to do all of this. And, and, and this is understandable. And I don't believe that God would expect. I think they were doing it because here was something new. And I don't believe that God expects us to come up here every day. Even though the first church did. In the, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, you find that they met daily. Now, could we could we do that here at Belmont? It would, 
just be almost impossible for that to be done here at Belmont. So what do we have left? Now we can't be here Monday, here at Ben and all of that uh, bunch <laughs> from Greenwood. See. Now if we have we we decide we have service eight o'clock Monday. So you got a job, you can't be here. I mean, if you do, they're gonna fire you. And, and if you insist and go to another job, they're gonna fire you off that job. First thing you know, you're gonna be knocking on my door wanting some groceries. I ain't got it. So we've got, we've got, we've got what have what we can't do what they were doing, but what can we do? This is the thing that I'm trying to get to. We can't do that, but what? What can we do? Huh? I mean, we shouldn't let the world control us in six days and have such an attitude when we come here all the morning that we don't Rhonda, I really believe that there. I be, I really believe that people are willing to do. But the fact is, I, I won't say everyone, but I, I'm I'm totally convinced that. That people here in Belmont, I believe they're willing to do it. They just can't do it. I mean, you can't. Uh, Irvin can't. He got to put a roof on my house some of these days. <laughs> he can't be here in, in the Bible study. So what I'm asking is, is what do we have? What can we do to make up for that which we cannot do? Study. Pray, and when we come here, mean business. And I believe when we do that, I believe that God will bless our efforts. And, and we'll be surprised. I think we really will be surprised. I would, I would, I would hope so. Now, we, did we get that song? Hear instruction and be wise and, and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. There every day waiting for Solomon to appear to share his wisdom. And you know that uh, the Bible teaches us that he was he had more wisdom than any man that we know of. So Solomon wasn't like me. When Solomon walked out to the door and he began to talk, he said something. I mean, he he had the knowledge in his soul. He had the knowledge in his head, and and there's no doubt in my mind that he could that he could just hold your attention, and you'd sit there like a dummy mummy or whatever. Your statue is what I meant to say, not a dummy. A statue until he finished. It took all day. There's instances in the Bible. What times in the Bible when people sit there? From morning until night. Oh, they didn't have. They didn't have. I'm glad you said what you did. You have a Bible. They have a Bible. Why come to church? I, I mean, I, 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 I didn't say that to be up. Is that the only reason you come? You got a Bible? This is one thing that you must remember, people. You will, in order to learn, in order to be to learn the Word of God, you must have a God called teacher. I have to have one, you have to have one. Everybody has to have one. I'm no different than you. I have to have a teacher. Now we can say, well, we got the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and depend on the Holy Spirit. You see, God gave us the Holy Spirit to translate and to help us understand, but the Holy Spirit's not going to do it all. Be real quiet. I'm going to let him finish these other two verses. Get the point. All right, I, I'm not. I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, waiting at my waiting at the post of my 
doors. Verse 35, For whoso findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. For whoso findeth me, findeth life. Now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even dare think that Solomon is saying, Believe upon me to have eternal life. He's not saying that, but what is he saying? It would be the same thing as I saying, if you believe on how to care, then that, that guarantees you eternal life. You know better than that, wouldn't you? All right. This is the thing. It's, it's the instruction will be concerning God, and if we believe Solomon, then we're going to have, uh, he says, Who, whoso findeth me, uh, findeth life. What kind of life? What else? All right. He's not only talking about eternal life here, he's not talking about salvation. I mean, that's he, he's, he's, that must come first, but he's talking about the abundant life. And this is really what Solomon is, is, is making reference to is that when you have eternal life, if you listen to the instruction of God, then you experience. That abundant life that Jesus was talking about when he said, I'm coming that you have life and have more abundant. Right. So what look at the other side of the coin. Always look at the other side of the coin. Without it, then then you're not going to have the abundant life. Let him have his way in your life, people. Let God have his You know, this is the reason that God sent the Holy Spirit. And I do it, I do it. Crudely, I understand that, but how does it work? God sent the Holy Spirit, and, and I gave you an illustration. You'll never hear the audible voice of the Holy Spirit saying anything. But the Holy Spirit was sent to say to you and to me, to every believer, now this is what God wants you to do. This is what God wants you to do. This is God's plan for your life. This is God's purpose for saving you. This is a daily thing that the Holy Spirit will dictate to us using the scripture that's embedded in our soul as to how we are to live for God in order to receive the abundant life. Now you think about uh, how important the Word of God is to be in your soul. And those people that don't attend church or don't know where the Bible is taught, they will never have this. Because the only way that the Holy Spirit can operate is to operate on the Word of God. He takes the Word of God and He interprets it and, 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 he, and He uses it to cause you to be an obedient child of God in order to have the blessings. Not eternal life, but the blessings that go with it. All right, any question? Whoso findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. What is that favor? Boy, this is something. And, and I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, huh? Well, no, not really. We use it that way sometimes, but that's not really what it's talking about in the Hebrew. Um, here's the coin again. For whoso findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. Now, everything that we have is a gift that God gives to us. We have nothing of our own. Eternal life is a gift. All right, now let's grow in this eternal life. We have salvation. We have eternal life. We have everlasting life. We are at the starting point. Do we want to stay there? No. So if we don't want to stay there, we hear the instruction of Almighty God, or we hear the instruction that comes from Him, <clears throat> 
and we and we do not refuse it, we do not ignore it, we do not reject it. We accept it, we make it a part of ourselves. So what happens to it? We begin to grow. And we grow. And we grow. You see, we're like that sponge. We're taking in di uh, Bible doctrine. We're taking in the Word of God. And we're growing. And we're growing. What's eventually going to happen to that growth? Super very slight. That's what he's talking about. Super grace life. Moses was a super grace believer. Paul was a super grace believer. Peter, after his rejection, and that's what he did when he stood and, uh, and, and, and cursed and said, I never knew him. He became a super grace believer. Now, you can just look at those men in the Bible be able to understand what a super grace believer is. And, and, and don't you ever think that, I, that, that we don't need to ask ourselves, am I a believer or a super grace believer? And if I can't answer it and say I'm a super grace believer, then, then I know that there's a great need for more growth. And I'm tempted to ask, how many super grace believers do we have in here? I say, I can't even hold that mind. So what does that tell me? It tells me that I need to grow. I need to grow a little more. I need to put into practice a little more the things that I already know. <laughs> so there's room in each of our lives to do better. And if we do, then we're going uh, to reach that super grace life. But in verse 36, he that sins against me, <clears throat> wrong at his own soul. All they that hate me love death. What is he talking about there? And then you get this and then we'll quit. sounded good. What we need, the only thing uh, that would be bad about having loud singing out on top of the church, the first bad to church y'all singing, that music director up there was worth that part of this trying to get them to do the job. Any announcements? Anybody want to volunteer to take this lesson and teach it tonight? I've had more trouble with it. I've had more trouble with it. Our Heavenly Father, we have been made to realize just how much we need your help in understanding what you've written for us, Lord. We pray that we will have the leadership of your Holy Spirit now. Help us, dear Lord, that we'll understand in the right way and we'll be able to understand what you're saying to us. Father, I pray that you'll help me to be able to explain what you said portion of scripture that has been chosen for our study this evening. And we pray that you'll bless this portion to the nursing of our souls. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. We're in Romans <coughs> chapter 3 and we were ready for verse 3 after having come from the bypass in Proverbs. I believe I'm right at heart. Am I not? So let's begin reading with verse 1 of the third chapter, and then we'll begin our exegesis in verse 3. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? 
much every way, chiefly because, or mainly because, that unto them were committed the articles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? And then, then it says, God forbid. And it's just been an awful battle for me to try to understand what he said in verses 3, 4, and 5. And then we find the same thing again in verse 6. And I finally uh, <coughs> had my eyes open to the fact that this was a debate. This is a debate. When we're reading these, it's there, we, we have to realize, first of all, and under, to understand it, that Paul is having a debate with what man thinks and what is like. Any, <laughs> any questions? Paul is having a discussion with himself. He's having a debate with himself. He's taken both sides of the issue. He's taken the side of, 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 of what man thinks and how man judges God. And then he's taken the side of Almighty God and, and, and uh, I've lost my word, the integrity of God. This is, in reality, what it all boils down to. We're dealing with the integrity of, of, of God. Does God mean what He say? Did He say what He meant? And does He mean what He said? What He said. So, with this in mind, uh, for what if some did not believe? And in the Greek, uh, it talks about some not believing, but the reason for their not believing is because they refuse. Go back to verse uh, uh, 2 where it says unto them were committed the oracles of God and, and, and just one verse of scripture explains what we're talking about there. He came unto his own and his own received him not. In other words, we all know and understand that God gave them the first opportunity to be saved. He, he, he gave the plan of salvation to the chosen people and his intention, or his aim, his plan was for the chosen people to take the gospel and, and carry it to the uttermost, utter, uttermost parts of the world. But some did not believe. Now, here's the question that Paul is asking. What if, what if some refused to believe? Or what, what if some did not believe? In other words, they had an opportunity, and the same, it's the same principle today. Shall their unbelief, or what if some did not believe? Now that, that, that gives us two sides here. Some did believe, and some did not believe. Some of them uh, believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed he was the Messiah, and, and, and they were saved. But uh, what Paul is doing here, what, what if some did not believe? What does that do to the integrity of God? Does God mean what he's, uh, did God mean what he said or said what he meant, what happened? Shall, and then he asked the question, shall their unbelief, or just because they did not believe, or because they refused to believe, does that keep me from believing? Uh, does that mean that, that God suddenly decided that he would remove the plan of salvation. Uh, does it mean because some did not believe that I cannot believe, or that I, does that mean that God will refuse to give me faith the size of, of a grain of mustard seed so that I can believe upon it? Uh, just because some of them did not believe or refused to believe, what does that do to the integrity of God? Uh, what about you and I today? If, if, if it was true what man was saying, and we'll, we'll get into this in just a little bit, uh, in verse 4 where it says, God be, Yea, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy, in thy sayings. In other words, uh, he's talking about the integrity of God. When God says something, or if God said something, he meant what he said. Now, we live in a time that 
is almost parallel to how man thought and what he believed when this was written, when Paul was writing. And there were some that, that actually believed because some of them did not believe uh, when, when the plan of salvation was offered because they refused to believe, because they did not believe that God would withdraw his offer of salvation. And what Paul is saying here, he's saying, God forbid. All right, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? In other words, uh, where does our faith, how do we obtain the faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, uh, I think maybe here is where we misunderstand sometimes. We must, we must believe, we must remember that we don't do anything. When you were saved, you didn't do anything except believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. What caused you to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ to the saving of your soul? It was faith. And faith came to you because of grace. For by grace are you saved. Through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, it is a gift of God. You know, it's nothing that we do. So we must remember that God gets all of the credit. Now, if I'm going to drum up enough faith myself to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then God doesn't get all of the credit. The Holy Spirit doesn't get all of the credit. I have to have some of the credit myself because I mastered the art of giving myself faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you follow what I'm saying? What I'm saying is this. What if some did not believe, or just because some did not believe, does that mean that we can never have faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? And what I'm asking is this. Where did you get the faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? You mean after all that rambling I did, you still <laughs> you can't. We got we got just enough faith to be saved by the Holy Spirit. In other words, when he called us or or moved us at that time we that particular moment to give us enough of to either accept or reject us. Alright. Um there had to be there had to be, before you could be saved, there had to be a time when you heard the word. You have to hear the word. You cannot be saved without, first of all, hearing the word of God. Now, when you heard the word of God, it would have done you no good just to hear without the Holy Spirit doing his office work. And that simply means this in my own human terms. When we heard the word, the Holy Spirit was there acting as the human spirit, communing uh, with himself, because we didn't have a human spirit. And in essence, what he said, that, that is what God has promised. You can believe that. And, and when we heard the way to, uh, that, that we could be saved, the Holy Spirit says, now you... That's the truth of God. You can believe that. And at that moment, God gave us the faith to believe what we had heard. He gave us the faith. We didn't have the faith. We were lost people. You, you were lost up until the moment of salvation. So uh, there was no way that you could say, well, I, I'm, I just decided, just suddenly come up with enough faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It had to be given. So faith is a gift that God gave to you the, when you heard the word and the Holy Spirit made it clear to you. Now, you didn't see the Holy Spirit. You didn't hear an audible voice. But uh, at that moment, when at the time that you believed, whether you realized it at that time or not, the Holy Spirit was there saying, now, you can accept that. You can believe that. That is the word of God. That is the truth. We're dealing with the integrity of God. 
God meant what he said. And just because someone doesn't believe doesn't mean that God cut off the gift of faith. This is what Paul, and this is what Paul is saying. All right? For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? In other words, uh, you have to have faith in God to be saved. Where is it going to come from? It's going to come from God. How do we get it? God gives it to us when we hear the word and under the uh, convicting of the Holy Spirit, he gives us that little grain of faith. To believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ for the saving of our soul. And then we began to grow from there. So what Paul is arguing here, this is debate. Debate. Is it a fact, because some did not believe, does that do away with God's plan of salvation for everybody else? So we move into verse 4. God forbid. Now, what that simply is saying that that God would forbid something like this taking place. In the day that this was written, this was a very strong denial. God forbid. God would never allow anything like this to happen. Here again, we, we're dealing with the integrity of, is God a liar? Is he a promise breaker? Or does he mean, or did he mean what he said? Now, uh, this word is not even used much anymore. God forbid. You don't use this much anymore. And what it is simply saying that God would refuse, or he would forbid something that tragic taking place. Uh, you still hear a few country folks uh, use the word God forbid. But, but it's, it's a very weak thing today. It's like most of the Word of God. The Word of God is is very weak today because of what man has tried to do to it. It's very weak. Uh, I want you to remember this. That everything that you read in the Word of God came from God. You remember when, uh, when Jesus was in the wilderness and he was tempted and and the devil said, if thou be the Son of God, command these stones uh, to be made bread. And you remember what Jesus said in answer to him? Does any of you remember? All right. Uh, the Lord said, in, uh, in other words, uh, Satan knew scripture is written. If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And Jesus came back with scripture and says, it is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, if you look closely at that, that is saying there's not one jot or one tittle, not one word in all of the word of God can we ignore. It's all there for our benefit. It came from God. God spoke it. Uh, he had man to write it. He breathed upon uh, a man, and man wrote exactly what God wanted him to write so that there's no error, no mistakes. This is the absolute word of God. We can depend on it uh, because God cannot lie. So he says then, God forbid that he would refuse to allow something like this to happen. Just because Diane refused to believe, it doesn't mean that Wendy can't believe. Just because one would not do it, uh, God has not withdrawn his offer of salvation. So he said, God forbid, yea, and that word yea means in fact. Here is an absolute. We run across a lot of absolutes. In fact, I think all of the Bible is absolute. He says, let God be true. Now, I think we sort of touched on this. I got ahead of myself. Uh, in one of our studies, let God be true and every man a lie. It doesn't make any difference. Now, we used, I think, John 3, 16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When, 
Now forget about the word. Forget about the word. And look at it as a statement. John 3.16 is a statement that God made. For God so loved the world and so forth and so on. So forget about the word. And let me ask you a question. When you look at it as a statement, now we know John wrote this in the Gospel of John. He wrote this. But he wrote it under the dictation. Uh, he wrote it under the power and inspiration. He wrote what he was told to write. God is the author. And John was the penman. He was the uh, scribe that wrote this down. All right. If we look at it as a statement, which we must do, when did God make that statement? And if you remember, I said that uh, it might not have been to the, to the ninth class. It might have been to the latest class. I don't remember. But I distinctly remember saying that this statement was made before John was ever born. Remember that? When did he make it? What does John 3.16 say? What does it say? It is a statement. God made in a statement. For God so loved the world. For I love the world so much I gave my only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in me should not perish but have everlasting life. When was that statement made? Well, in reality, it's before the foundation of the world, but I'm talking about uh, when, when, what was the time that, that it could be visualized? All of this, you're right, all of this took place, all of this took place in the mind of God somewhere back under before time ever was, somewhere back in eternity. With God, there's no beginning and there's no ending, so this is always me in the, in the mind of God. Uh, it has always been. But when was it that it could first of all be visualized? And then when was the <laughs> second time? First time in the garden, the second time in the garden. What do you mean, in the garden? Uh, when God had to swallow the animals to, to take their clothing to cover their sins. Now, can you see that? Can you see that's saying exactly the same thing that John 3.16 is saying? It, exactly. That's the reason I told you, forget about the word. And look at it as a statement being made. When God killed those innocent animals, what was he doing? He was visualizing or he was bringing into focus what John 3.16 would say hundreds of years later. When was the second time? No, no, no. There were many, 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 many. Huh? Or a long time before then. What? Long time before then. When did you get your nose screwed up over there? I'm telling you, thank you. When was? There you go. Tell me about it. <laughs> no, when he accepted Abel's sacrifice. This was why he rejected the, the, the offering uh, or the gift of Cain. Because it did, listen, it, it, he rejected it because it did not say what John 3.16 says. I mean, when he walked up there and said, here's a cabbage head, you know, this is the work of my hand. That didn't say what John 3.16 said. That was no promise. But when, when Abel gave him the bloody sacrifice, you think about it, look at it. It's, it, it was making the same statement that you find in John 3.16. Here again, we're dealing with the integrity of God. God forbid. God cannot lie. God would not allow something like this to happen. This is why you and I sit here tonight 
uh, with the gift of eternal life, and we know. We know we have eternal life. We don't worry about whether or not we have eternal life. We have it. Why? Because God said that we have it. If we believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, we have eternal life and we will never perish. All right. This is what Paul is saying. All right. So he says, let, but every man, let God be true and every man a lie. If you see, it doesn't make any difference what I say, what man says. It doesn't make any difference what man may say or what he may think or what he may do. It, that has no bearing on the integrity of God. I might get up here and preach uh, God uh, when when those refuse to believe, God removes the gift of eternal life. It doesn't make any difference what I say. And this was what was going on. This is what Paul was trying to get straight. So it doesn't depend on what I say. It doesn't make any difference if every man, that's what it says, every man becomes alive. God is still going to be true. God is still going to be true. So we can count and depend upon the integrity of God or of knowing that God will not back up on what he says. Now, if he says that a lost person is going to go to hell, that's exactly what's going to happen. The same is true if he says that a believer will go to heaven, that's exactly what's going to happen. That's what eternal life means. That's what everlasting life means. If you're saved tonight, you're going to heaven and all hell cannot keep right. Even God cannot change that. And we're not taking anything away from God. It says all things are possible with God. Uh, we misunderstand that sometimes. You see, God cannot take eternal life away from you and still be God because he becomes alive. And, 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 and a God cannot lie. So we can stand on what uh, God has said, what he has promised. So we can see Paul, well, if you go on down just a little bit, uh, I went too fast there, I think. Look at verse 5, and, and where it says, But if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Uh, is God unrighteous? Who take his vengeance and notice in parentheses, he says, I speak as a man. Now that was the thing that was tripping me up. Uh, I, I couldn't get it through my thick skull what he was saying in these other verses until I finally understood this. And then I understood that Paul was in a debate with himself, or he was in a debate with what man was saying as compared to to what God had already said. So there are two sides of this issue here, and Paul was debating both sides. All right, any questions? All right, but every man a liar, no matter what man may say, God will remain true to his word, as it is written. Now this is written in Psalms 51, 4. And what it really teaches is that whatever is written, now, I want you to get this, and I want you to carry it home with you. Whatever is written will take place. Whatever is written. I don't care where you are in the Word of God, whatever is written will happen. It will happen because God said it would happen, and God will see to it. Now, if we believe that God is all-powerful, if we believe that He is God, then we must also believe that whatever he says will come to pass. So we can get on both sides of the issue here. Um, that as it is written, thou that <clears throat> mightest be justified, that thou mightest be justified in thy saving, and mightest overcome when thou art judged, that thou mightest be justified, now, you know something. This is Bible. God's Word. But tell me what kind of a person 
would it be that would expect God to justify himself? It would have to be a lost person, would it not? I mean, I don't believe that there's a saved person. I don't believe there's a person in this in this auditorium. I don't believe there's a saved person in the world that has any knowledge, any workable knowledge of the Word of God at all would expect. Now, you prove what you say. <coughs> As used here, look at it real close. In uh, verse uh, verse four, God forbid, yea, let God be true, and every man a liar, as it is written, that that thou mightest be justified. Now, in thy sake, how would you interpret that? Are you thinking about a proof and I hear what it says, the Lord, if I'm not open up the windows of hell? Or a found in Malachi? Oh, that's good. Oh, if you had a Bible, I mean, I won't say that we're testing the Lord, but, uh, but there are times when, like when we get down so far and we hear a sermon and it kind of jars us back into reality and it says, go back to the five, you know, five of Scripture. Try the spirit to see if they'd be of that time. Maybe I can help you there. Well, I don't think right with you when I'm talking about it. I think I think you are. Uh, uh, maybe 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 you're not quite seeing what I'm saying. Uh, in the uh, in the third chapter of Malachi, verse ten, where it says, Bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And, and notice now, and prove me now. Now, who's doing the talking? God. God. But see now, you see the difference? God is saying, check me out. Let me prove myself to you. Now, that that is somewhat different than me standing there saying, now prove yourself. See, I'm being invited to prove God. I'm being invited in Malachi to allow God to prove himself by doing what? What, what am I to do in order for God to prove himself? God is saying, now you, you go ahead and prove me. I'm giving you permission to test me. <coughs> what must I do in order to, to see if God means this? Uh-huh. Which is what? Which is trusting God. Bring the tithe into the storehouse, which is the same thing. So th- this is different, you see. We're 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 being invited to do it. But now, if if God says now, uh, I'll you bring the tithe into the storehouse, and I will bless you, and I'll say, okay, prove it to me. Justify yourself in what you just said. You see, that is that that is saying, well, I really doubt you. I, I really can't depend on whether or not you're telling me the truth or not. Now, if you'll notice what I'm saying, is, I ain't fixing to bring no tithe to the storehouse. I want God to prove what he has said. Now, this... This is exactly what man was doing that that brought about what Paul says here. That thou mightest be justified. All right, let, let me nail it down just a little more. Let's take one of the, 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 the most terrible, awful things 
that God has ever seen. What is the most terrible thing that God could say to you? What is he going to say at the great white throne? Oh. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew. Go to hell. <laughs> now, hear me. God is going to say that. This is one of the absolute. It, it will actually be said at the great white throne judgment. Now, notice what he has said. That, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings. That, that God will be proven right. That, that God said it. That's the way it's going to happen. Why? I mean, how can God say to someone, depart from me, go to hell, I've never known you. How can he say that? How can he, how can he say that and be justified in saying it? Carrying out the sentence. How can God do that and still be justified? Because he's already warned you. He's already warned. He didn't. You didn't go to hell because you were never warned. That's how God can be justified because He's already warned, and it, and it began with, with the creation of the human race. So God stands justified at the great white throne judgment when He says to the unbeliever, "Depart from me. I never knew you. I warned you." Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. And they didn't do it. So God got mad. This is this is what Paul is debating. So God got mad and said, Because some of them didn't believe, I'll just take away the gift of eternal life. I, I won't give anybody any faith anymore. That's why he said, God forbid, God would not allow something like that to happen. Because we're dealing with the integrity of God. God meant what he said. All right. Let every man be a liar. God be true and every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sin. No matter, no matter what God has said, it will come to pass. But because of how God operates, he'll always be justified. The Bible says that he is the justifier of them that believe, right? He is just, he is just, and the justifier of them that believe. Now, when you want to tear that thing apart and look at it, it says the same thing that we've been talking about. God is just. He says, if you reject my son, you're going to hell. Now, he's warned us about that. That's what's going to happen. So when, when the parting count comes at the great white throne judgment, God is going to be justified. He's going to be proven right. He, they can find no fault with him because he's already warned everybody. Now, what about that person that, that has never heard of You see, you have to go all the way back to Adam and Eve. That's where it started. So every man, there's no man that has an excuse for not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says even the, even the heavens do All right, that thou mightest be justified by thy saying. God can always say, I warned you. 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 And there's warnings since the beginning of the first sin. By the way, what is sin? Disobedience to God. I don't care what kind of sin you can mention. The man's always disobedience to God. That's what the first sin was. God says, don't eat. They get it. Disobedience. But in any sin that you can think of, uh, it's disobedience. That's what sin is. Uh, John 3, 16 said, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I disobey Every sin is disobedience to God. All right, that, that you might be justified in the saying, 
and you might overcome when thou art judged. Now, what are we talking about here? Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, I don't believe God would send me to hell for not going to church? Well, how many people has God ever sent to hell? God don't send people to hell. You see, hell was not even created for us. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. Now, if we wind up there, it's not because God sent us, but here again, we're dealing with God's integrity. If I reject his grace, if I reject his forgiveness, what am I saying? Well, we studied that when? Last week, two weeks ago, might have been. I get, I get the morning latest class and the night class mixed up. Have we got any questions so far? Any questions that you have so far? <laughs> Verse five. We'll, 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 we'll start this. I don't know. But if our unrighteousness, or if you think this ain't a payment, if our unrighteousness commands the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous? Is David vengeance? as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? But if our unrighteousness what does that say? If our unright if our sinfulness commends the righteousness of God if, if this be true, how is it that God can judge the world? If our unrighteousness commends, you know what that is saying? No. No, not really. You see, when God, what this is saying, and, and I hope that I say it where you can understand it. If our unrighteousness, now, now because we are a sinner, and God forgives those sins, that makes God look good. Don't look at me in that uh, <laughs> unbelief. Uh, that made me look good. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about. Right? All God is tied up with the Lord. And if we don't But notice, notice it says, but if, if, now Paul is not saying that this is what's happening. You notice where Paul is now. Paul is over here on man's side. He's using the personal pronoun there, our. If our unrighteousness commands Or you can use another word there, and it won't be wrong with forgiveness. In other words, what man is saying, this is what we're talking about. This is the debate. Man is over here saying one thing, and the word of God and the integrity of God is over here saying another thing. So Paul takes the side of man, and he says, 
if our unrighteousness makes God look good. When he forgives us, how can he stand there on the day of judgment and judge the world? Because the world has made him look good. Now that's what man is saying. That's not what God said, and that's not what the Bible said. But that's what man. We'll go back a little bit. It says, uh, that, that in verse 4, where it says, That thou mightest be justified in thy, in thy sins, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Mankind is judging God. And mankind is saying, look what we do for God. Here we are, we are unrighteous, we are sinners, and God forgive. That makes God look good because the world looks upon it as God doing something good for mankind. And, and, and God did do something good for mankind. I haven't got to you, have you? You can't see what man is saying. Man is judging God. And man is saying, in other words, here I am. God forgave my sins. Now, what man is saying that God, that I, that I did something nice for God, and <clears throat> that I allowed him to forgive my sin. Look at the word recommend. But if our uh, command, if our, uh, what does that word mean? If our unrighteousness command the righteousness of God. If our unrighteousness command, what does that word command say? What does it mean? Well, that, that could be one way. But what does the word compliment as you're using it there? Why would you do that? Like what you're saying, if I if I sinning makes God, you know, look good, because I understand what you're saying. I can't say it to you. I understand what you're saying on that. If, if, if the word come in, if our unrighteousness makes God look good, if we if we are commending, if mankind does anything. In other words, because we are sinners, it makes God look good when he says your sins are forgiven. I wish you'd have said it earlier. <laughs> All right, now, now, now let me tell you, here's Bob. 